Good morning, everyone. I always feel like something's missing when I don't have Larry to clip on here, but uh, we will move forward, keeping him in our thoughts and prayers this morning. Um, I I was laughing as I was making my way here because uh, it's always uh, one thing to agree to allow people to record things like these sermons. It's another thing when I receive a call all the way from Alberta to find out people are actually listening to them. It's very scary. and makes me think twice, but know that there's people across Canada snooping on all of you this morning, and, uh, and beware, be mindful. Um, let's open with a word of prayer, and we're going to dive into the word this morning and look back at a few things from uh, 1 Corinthians. Let's pray. Lord, thank you again for this morning, an opportunity to worship you, to honor you, to know you. I pray again this morning that as we open your word, that we will trust that you alone will speak to our hearts not an intellectual endeavor, not something, a word that we can simply pull apart to understand, but one that we must truly rely on the presence of your person and spirit to know. Not just the written word, but the living word to whom it speaks and testifies of. I pray this morning again that uh, as we open these words, that we would have encouragements of what it means to live life in your way today, Thank you that you are a loving God that does not leave us nor forsake us, but is willing to take the long road, the hard road, in order to see that we might become what you have longed for, and that is to be conformed to the image of your very Son. And today we just want to grab hold of you as you've grabbed hold of us in light of that work that you have long to complete in us. So thank you for this this morning as we open your word together. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, this morning, we're going to carry forward, uh, as the Lord has been just reminding me in a number of ways, uh, through 1 Corinthians. And for those who have not been with us over the past uh, many Sundays that I've had the privilege of being able to be with you, we've been zigzagging our way through the first four chapters or so of 1 Corinthians, looking at what Paul was writing to this church in Corinth. And as we've zigzagged our way through, we've seen a few things thus far. The first, that Paul wanted to address their position versus their condition. That is who God had made them to be when they welcomed Jesus into their lives, the Spirit of God, that they now were accepted children of God, called holy as God is holy. And yet their condition on earth had not yet lined up with the position God had now given them. Now citizens of heaven, though living on earth, their condition, lawsuits, fighting, uh, where God's spirit is uh, selfless and giving, they had become selfish and hoarding, and we will see that as we read on. But we also saw, as Paul addressed these things, that he was looking at many things, that is, that this church in their division had begun raising the many things about God and made them greater than God himself. We talked about how the building become bigger than the one whom it's built for. How the things that are to point us to Jesus can become greater than Jesus himself when we long for the blessings over the blesser, the gifts over the giver. As we read on, we looked, and they did this very thing with the, the apostles, as they said, I'm of Paul, I'm of Cephas, I'm of Apollos. And they began to honor the disciples, the apostles, more than Jesus, the one whom they were speaking about. They began to praise the messengers more than the message to which God had given them. We also looked, as we looked last Sunday, that we need to learn to look through the, the right lens today. And that is that we need to look at things and appraise things appropriately. Today we can look at things with the mind of Christ because God has given us the Spirit of God. And if we would look with the right lens today, we will begin to see things appropriately, not as the world sees them, not putting people like the apostles on a pedestal, but for what they really are. Not looking at our circumstances for what the world says they are not looking at other people's opinions and putting them in a great place, but living before the audience 
of one, allowing God to appraise and value our lives and actions as we learn to look with his eyes, listen with his ears, and appraise our surroundings with his vision, his understanding. And only then can we begin to truly live. Now, all of this can be put over as we read those last verses and did together in in chapters 3 and 4 in which they were looking with the wrong lens. They were seeing Paul and the apostles, not how the Lord sees them, simple messengers, but as something greater than they actually were. And that's something we looked at in which we saw as we read Corinthians together that our lives need to become something more than the words that we speak. In fact, God wants to use our lives to speak the message more than the words we say. And that's what the apostles were. Remember, the dregs of all things, the scum of the earth, examples to all, the least to be desired. Why? Because God had put them in a place where it wasn't just their words, but their lives had become a message to a watching world of what it meant to walk with and lay down your lives before a loving God. Now we're caught up. (laughs) Here, we're going to step forward. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, and we're going to take a turn because as we look now, and if our lenses are looking in the right place, we're going to begin to see things. And where I want to start this morning is with something I learned from a friend I met in my travels across the United States. Her brother was a U.S. Marine. And that U.S. Marine, hoorah, and the whole bit, he had a life motto. Do you want to know what that motto was? It was this. Pain is simply the feeling of weakness leaving the body. Doesn't that sound like something a Marine would say? Pain is simply the feeling of weakness leaving the body. Some of you would like to refute that this morning, I'm sure, as you got out of bed with aches and pains this morning and saying, I'm not feeling anything leaving. I'm just feeling weakness screaming and it's not helping. But listen, that Marine had learned to embrace things and see things differently. They had begun to take it, and what we see as suffering, they understood something, and that was that suffering led to an end. That suffering had a purpose, and that purpose was, as you felt weakness suffer, there was loss, that there was going to be gain on the other side. Weakness was leaving, and strength was coming in. You see, that is something, a lens through which they were looking at life and allowed them to embrace their circumstances, their suffering, their training in a way that perhaps today I cannot understand. And sometimes I look at them and can simply say the words, you're crazy, right? But listen, when our lens is affixed and is the right lens through which we are looking through, when we begin to evaluate and appraise things according to God's ways, today we begin to see things in a different light. And this morning, as we read chapter 5, and we left off last Sunday looking at the fact that though we, we worship a loving God, a patient God, a fatherly God, one who is merciful to sinners like us. We also worship a holy God. And last Sunday, we talked about the fact that though he is merciful to sinners, he is merciless towards sin. In Leviticus 19, he says in verse 2 and 3, listen, live holy because I am holy. I have bought you with a price. Therefore, today he has called us to live according not to our ways, but his ways. Paul goes on in 2 Corinthians and says, remember, one died, therefore all have died. He died that you may no longer live for yourselves, but for he who died for you. You see, he died, therefore he also presented and gave us a purpose this morning. And as we come, we want to look at things now with a new lens, our circumstances, but also our time of training on this earth. Hoorah, you could say this morning, as we look and know that God has for us something greater than just getting on with getting along with the everyday. 
He's not only got a greater purpose, he's willing to take the long road and the hard road to see us through that purpose. I think I've read for you before, and if we had time, we'd read it again, and I'm sure we will again and again together. It tells us that we are predestined in Romans chapter 8, not to heaven or to hell, though we love to have that long conversation. It says that he foreknew those, and it goes on to tell us that we've been predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son. Heaven, again, was going to be a ramification, an outworking of a relationship with God. But that is the end, not the beginning. You see, when we join our lives to Jesus, it is not to just enjoy heaven one day, but it is to begin to live a heavenly life here on earth today that we might be conformed to the image of his very son, not then, though we will be face to face, but now in this moment. Being conformed is not a comfortable thing. Being made into the image, sculpted, molded, not pleasing in the moment, and yet an eternal outcome, an eternal greatness, an eternal reward to be seen. You see, this is what we need to understand as we pick up in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and as Paul has begun to pick apart a church in which he knows that they were called as saints, children of God by position. Yet up until now, their condition on this earth has not been heavenly, but earthly. And as a loving father, as any loving parent, he is now not going to simply say they are who they are. Let them be as they will be. Paul is willing to take the long road and the hard road that he might see them come to the fullness, not of just what they can be, but when God has his way, what they will be. And that is to see them in the image. And we're going to see that in a moment. In fact, when we look at things, we see him go, perhaps in such a harsh way that I, it often even surprises me. It says this in chapter 5 in 1 Corinthians. Listen as I read. It is actually reported that there is immorality among you, an immorality such a kind as does not exist even among the Gentiles, that someone has his father's wife. You've become arrogant and have not mourned instead so that the one who had done this deed would be removed from your midst. For I on my part, though absent in body, but present in spirit, have already judged him who has committed this as though I were present. In the name of our Lord Jesus, when you are assembled and I with you in spirit with the power of our Lord Jesus, I have decided to deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of his flesh. Now I'm going to stop there for a moment. Because as we read, these are harsh words, aren't they? It's not often that you hear a pastor hand someone over to Satan on a Sunday morning, is it? And yet, this is what Paul does. Wow. Well, when we look at the immorality in their midst, what Paul says here is this, someone has his father's wife. Now, if it were someone sleeping with his own mother, that would have been one thing. This, he's, when he says his father's wife, it's not his mother, but rather his stepmother that someone is engaging in sexual conduct with. So now, it's not his mom, but his stepmom, that this person in the midst of the congregation is engaging in sexual activity, immorality, and the congregation has just allowed it to go on and move on without any correction or thought. They have openly welcomed them as they are. And this morning, I would hope that as a congregation, it is our aim to be a church defined by grace. <laughs> we all need grace this morning. There's not one of us who've gathered here today who can say that they are perfect, that they've got it all together, that they have not sinned. But in the midst of grace, 
Paul is standing forward. And note again, we're talking about a church that Paul has already called children of God, saints by calling, even though we see lawsuits in their midst, immorality, suing each other, hating each other, getting drunk. Oh, the many things they were doing. Pride. And yet, in the midst of this, here he's going to make a stand. And we're going to see this, not just on this issue, but many issues. Because he wants to see something greater in their midst. Not to become comfortable with sin. You see, sin, as we looked at last week, though sometimes subtle, we think nobody will see sin affects the whole camp. Sin, in God's eyes, is always serious. And today, as Paul stands forward, he is ready to go to the point and place where he is going to hand such a one over to Satan. How could the Apostle Paul say something so harsh? Well, this morning, I hope to pick apart the scriptures a little bit with you and come to an understanding of exactly what Paul is saying and what Paul is doing. Because here, he's about to enact some form of church discipline. And I think this morning it's important for us to look at the fact of what discipline is. Because in Scripture, we are called not only to play a role in helping discipline one another, but more importantly, to discipline ourselves before the Lord. To not just take sin and say, it's okay, forgiven, forget about it. And yes, the Lord forgives. And yet at the same time, by his risen and resurrection power provided the way of escape. And to go on willfully and wanderingly sinning, it's to say, Lord, thank you for your death, but your life isn't enough. Thanks for the ticket to heaven. Uh, unfortunately, uh, unfortunately, you haven't given me what it takes to live this godly life on earth. I wish there were more. And in fact, Hebrews goes on to say, it's like nailing him right back up on the cross every time. That he needs to die again and again. But Jesus reminds us, and as we're coming upon this Easter season, that Jesus died once and for all. And he didn't just die to stay in the grave, he rose again, that life might reign over death today that we might know that there is victory over the darkness this morning. And that is a daily victory, not once, but every day, as Jesus goes on, not that he saved us, but saving us from ourselves. Well, this morning, I want you to note this, that as we begin to look at discipline, not only of ourselves, but of those around us, we need to understand that there's a big difference between consequence or punishment and discipline. Often when I think I'm disciplining my kids, I confuse it with the words punishment. What's the difference? Punishment may be a part of discipline, but you can invoke punishment without discipline. Why? Discipline is a correction of the mind, a changing of one's way. Punishment is a penalty, a consequence. And yes, again, discipline may involve punishment, but here's the thing I'm going to admit to you this morning. I can woefully be a very lazy parent. Do you know why? Punishment is easy. And in my mind, I would love to simply see the circumstance done away with. When my kids are in that mood, and when there's five of them, and even two of them get on track, it's hard. Dad, can I have this? Dad, can I have this? Dad, can I have this? It's easy. Go sit on your bed. Right? Yes. Taken care of. They're out of my space. Problems dealt with. <laughs> They realize they can't have what they're asking for. Uh, when you guys, and I know some of you still think that my wife is a figment, figment of my imagination. She exists, I promise you. Uh, uh, listen, she is like 
uh, your BC healthy granola girl, uh, organic, and, and, and she's the one, uh, again, I take no credit, who's gotten our kids excited about these things where they'll be like, ooh, I'm craving a date. And they'll be like, what alien world are you from, son? Who eats dates, right? Oh, I want a banana right now. And I'm thinking, I, if I could eat a donut, I would be happy, satisfied. No, but these are my children. And yet all of a sudden, I, this last week, I need sugar, I need sugar. Dad, I need sugar. And I'm thinking, where now all of a sudden something's up. Who's, who's let them into the world of sugar, okay? Probably me, not my wife. But it'll be like, go to your room. I don't want to hear it. It's over. You see, punishment takes care often of the circumstances, doesn't it? it? It makes the immediate feeling fine because they're out of my space and I don't have to hear about it and immediately I feel like the problem's done. They're on their bed, they're realizing that begging leads to sitting on their bed. But here's a problem. There's a book that I love and I've probably quoted it before, I'll quote it again, Shepherding a Child's Heart. Do you know what it says? If you punish your child and you are able to get them to change their actions, but fail to change their heart. It is actually condemnable, not commendable. Why? You see, if I can simply show my kids the door that says, don't beg, and they stop pulling on my shirt and saying the words, but deep down in their heart, they go to their bed and they're stewing in their heart. Why didn't he give me what I wanted? Dad doesn't like me. How can I get, what can I do differently to get what I want, right? You see, I've affected their actions, but what have I failed to do? See, I've punished them, but punishment doesn't equal what? Discipline, a change of heart. And you see, this morning we need to understand this, that discipline often is the long road. Discipline is the hard road. Discipline is not punishment, though it can involve punishment. Discipline is the sitting down, taking the time, looking them in the eyes, and the conversation that says, what went wrong? Not on the outside, but on the inside. What do we need to change in here that will fix what came out here? That's discipline. But discipline takes time. Discipline takes effort. And discipline is often uncomfortable. Not only for me, but also for my child. Sometimes it takes half an hour for me to get them to just look me in the eyes. <laughs> right? Look at me, okay? <laughs> look at me, okay? <laughs> look at me. Okay, right? It's not comfortable. Because we have to go to the intimate place of the heart. And often, I'll say this again, as a lazy parent, I'm comfortable with punishment and leaving it there. Because I can move on with the surface smoothed. The ripples are out. But I'll tell you what, whenever I settle for punishment alone, what happens? the ugly heart will rise again to fight another day, won't it? It will. I know it. And yet I'll cover it up again. Listen, Paul, as he expresses the Lord's heart, says this. Listen, I am willing to do something here. And he says this, I have decided to deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of his flesh so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. You see, I want to know what's important here. And that is this, that when he hands this one over to Satan, there's always a so that in scripture. What does that mean? So that means whatever you've read, there's a purpose beyond. I am going to hand this one over to Satan so that. Why? Listen to this. So that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. You see, Paul is about to take an action in the hope that there is going to be a reaction. He wants to invoke discipline for a purpose. And all true discipline has the purpose and the hope of restoration, a returning of the mind. 
And this is what Paul is doing. How do we see this in God's character? It says this in Hebrews in chapter 12. Listen carefully. It says, it is for discipline that you endure. God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? But if you are without discipline, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Furthermore, we had earthly fathers to discipline us, and we respected them. Shall we not much rather be subject to the Father of spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time as seemed best to them, but he disciplines us for our good so that we may share in his holiness. All discipline for the moment seems not to be joyful but sorrowful, yet to those who've been trained by it afterwards, it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness. Therefore, strengthen the hands that are weak and the knees that are feeble." Revelation reminds us and goes on to tell us that he loves those whom he reproves and disciplines. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. You see, God is that father who is willing not to take the easy road, punishment, but is willing to take the long road in the hopes that we would be restored to that right relationship and know him in the fullness of his holiness. All the way through scripture, and I wish we had time to look at more. A great example, Ezekiel chapter 7. Listen to this. It says this in Ezekiel chapter 3. Uh, Ezekiel 7 and verse 3, rather. Listen to this. Now the end is upon you, and I will send my anger against you. I will judge you according to your ways and bring all your abominations upon you. My eye will have no pity on you, nor will I spare you, but I will bring your ways upon you, and your abominations will be among you, and then you will know that I am the Lord. Isn't that interesting? Listen, I am going to bring your ways upon you, and I am going to bring your abominations upon you, and your abominations will be in your midst. Then you will know what? that I am the Lord. You get the understanding that you know how idolatrous Israel was? They kept, God kept saying, I am holy, worship me alone. And they'd follow the Baals and worship the idols. And he'd say, follow me alone. And they'd worship the idols and follow the Baals. And finally God said, enough is enough. You want idols? I'll give you idols. I'm going to let Babylon and Assyria, the most idolatrous nations in the world, to overtake you and consume you. You want idols? I'll give you idols. And I'll tell you this, that when those idols are in your midst, when I give you all that your hearts desire, what are you going to see? You're going to begin to know what? That I am the... Lord, you're going to begin to see me. See, Paul doesn't just <laughs> irreverently hand someone over to Satan. Sounds exciting, doesn't it? No. He does so. He, he invokes an action in which his hope is that at the end, they will then see the Lord. Ever been cold? I think I've told you, often on a hike, you get to the end. We had our kids hike to some falls some time away. I picked them up in our warm car, which I had been warming in winter, and they all got in shivering, <laughs> and they began to hug the heaters. <laughs> it was amazing. Five people around the dashboard, but they managed. <laughs> Hugging the heaters, why? When you are cold, cold brings a longing for... Heat, warmth, doesn't it? Ever been in the darkness? Easter's coming. Never forget Quebec, snow, cold. Someone had the great idea of doing a sunrise service. BC makes a lot of sense. Quebec, not so much. <laughs> Shivering in a snowbank. <laughs> and someone also had the great idea of letting the sun rise before starting the fire. <laughs> and here we stood sitting in a snowbank, waiting for the sun to come up, Easter Sunday morning, hovering in this darkness together. The darkness brings what? When that light peeked over the skyline, 
Oh, longing for it, right? Darkness brings a longing for light. Ever had those times in which you've, you feel like the Lord's been quiet in your life? How quiet. All of a sudden, an incredible longing for God's voice. Dryness, longing for thirst, right? A quenching. Loneliness, longing for relationship. Too much relationship, longing for quietness. <laughs> right? But, but think about it this way. I am going to hand him over to Satan. And the hope is this, that when he gets to the very end and the fullness of the darkness that you're seeking, what's going to be at the end? A longing for the light. When he gets to the end of the darkness, a longing for the love of Jesus. Here's the big question for us, and that is this, that he goes on to say, listen, I'm going to deliver this one over so that they may be saved in the day of the Lord. If you read on into 2 Corinthians, it actually gives a full circle to a story. And I want you to remember this, that as we read 1 Corinthians, it actually tells us in 1 Corinthians that 1 Corinthians was not Paul's first letter. It actually tells us that Paul says, I wrote you in my letter. That tells us that as he was writing 1 Corinthians, he had previously written them. And this was a follow-up in a relationship. It actually tells us in, in 1 Corinthians, he goes on and says, now concerning the things which you wrote about, what does that tell you? Paul wrote, they wrote back. It was a correspondence going on. They asked questions, Paul answered. As he was addressing these things in their lives, one of the things we may look at as they ask questions, who is it appropriate to marry? And Paul's going to give a godly opinion. Well, as we read these words in 2 Corinthians, which is not the second letter, but one down, we don't know if he's addressing this same person, but I want you to hear these words that we read in 2 Corinthians in chapter 2. He says this in verse 5. He says, listen, I'll actually read from verse 4 in 2 Corinthians 2. Out of much affliction... And anguish of heart I wrote to you with many tears, not so that you would be made sorrowful, but that you might know the love which I have especially for you. But if any has caused sorrow, he has caused sorrow, not to me, but in some degree, in order not to say much, too much, to all of you. Now we don't know if this one is the same person in 1 Corinthians, but what we do know is that in their correspondence, someone, one, had caused great pain and anguish in the relationship between Paul and this church congregation. I want you to read what he says next. Verse 6. Sufficient for such a one is the punishment which was inflicted by the majority, so that on the contrary you should rather forgive and comfort him, otherwise such a one might be overwhelmed by excessive sorrow. Wherefore I urge you to reaffirm your love for him, for to this end also I wrote so that I might put you to the test, whether you are obedient in all things. Do you notice? As Paul writes, and as he affirms and confirms a punishment that had been handed forward by the congregation, that that punishment was for a purpose, and the purpose was not to just see that person punished, put out, set aside, but what? That their love might officially and finally be found reaffirmed to them, restored brought back into right relationship with the body. You see, Paul was willing to take the actions, take the long road, long suffer, that they might see the work of God. He says this about the letters that he wrote. Listen to this, reading on in 2 Corinthians, now in chapter 6 and verse 5. He says this, listen carefully. Even when we came into Macedonia, our flesh had no rest, but we were afflicted on every side, conflicts without, fears within. 
But God, who comforts the depressed, comforted us by the coming of Titus, and not only by his coming, but also by the comfort with which he was comforted in you, as he reported to us your longing, your mourning, your zeal for me, so that I rejoiced even more. For though I caused you sorrow by my letter, I do not regret it. Though I did regret it, for I see that the letter caused you sorrow, though only for a while. I now rejoice, not that you were made sorrowful, but that you were made sorrowful to the point of repentance. For you were made sorrowful according to the will of God, so that you might not suffer loss in anything through us." For the sorrow that is according to the will of God produces a repentance without regret, leading to salvation. But the sorrow of the world produces death. For behold, what earnestness this very thing, this godly sorrow has produced in you, what vindication of yourselves, what indignation, what fear, what longing, what zeal, what avenging of wrong in everything you demonstrated yourselves to be innocent in the matter." Isn't that great? Paul was happy, not that they had been made sorrowful, but that they had been made sorrowful to a point of godly repentance. He uses the word indignation there. I love that word. Do you know why? We get that understanding that the difference between the world's sorrow, feeling bad about something. And again, often when confronted with my wrong, I leave it there. I feel sorry. Sorry for myself. Sorry that I've failed. You know what indignation means? Anger on behalf of an injustice. Isn't that great? Not just angry, Not just angry because someone's accused me, though that comes quickly also. Indignation is is not self-righteous anger. That's wrong, sinful. But, But if a small child were being hurt and abused, indignation is anger on behalf of an injustice, something that is not right. And Paul wrote this letter, which produced a sorrow in them that achieved indignation. They became angry to the point of not just being mad about the sin, but angry to the point of wanting to do something about it. Repent. Put things right that were wrong. Take the hard road, the long road. I may have told you I have a friend who's a professional counselor And I'm often shocked at how quickly he's become a judge of character after the quick and many uh, reads he'll have and, and after years and years of service in the field. And we'll bring him someone and he'll say, not worth my time. And we'll say, that's harsh. Almost as harsh as handing them over to Satan. What do you mean, not worth my time? That's your job. He'll say, sorry, can't help you with this one. And another, which I think just as lost, he'll say, I'm all in. 24 hours, call me, I'm there. And you might ask, what's the difference? You know what he's become? In years and years of addictions counseling, and drug addiction, and uh, moral addictions and and abuses, You, you know what he's seen? He's a quick read now, on the difference between someone who's somewhat come to the end of themselves and someone who's actually reached the end of themselves. And you know what he said to me? The greatest problem that I have as a counselor today is that family members refuse to let loved ones get to the very bottom where I can actually begin to help them. He says, it's often when they've run out of money, run out of time, run out of work, run out of a place to live, and they're finally realizing that what they're doing isn't working. And no parent wants to see a child suffer, do we? And a last minute bailout, and a donation, and what? And a ticket right back into the rut. And he says, I've become a very quick read on those who think they're at the end. And the difference between those who've come to the end and actually know, and not only know they need help, but are ready to to receive it. 
You see, he's waiting for the time that he can come in and give help to the one who wants it. But sometime, you have to wait till they're at the end before there can be a new beginning. See, Paul was ready to take the hard road with his church, to say the hard words, to give tough love. But we can just see him as a hardened man, ruthless, cruel, punishing. But if we do, we've missed the mark altogether, haven't we? And if we think today that church punishment, and and I wish we had time to go through the verses, Matthew 18, right? Verse 15 and following. If your brother has done something, go to them personally. If they do not listen, go and take another. Personal confronting. Then coming and again together confronting. And if they still will not listen, go to the elders and what? Bring it before the church as a family lovingly and longingly wanting to see someone not just know Christ, but be fully in the image of Christ. And this is what Paul makes the distinction between. As we read on in 1 Corinthians, he says this. He says, uh, verse 6 in 1 Corinthians 5, he says, listen, clean out the old leaven so that you may be a new lump. Just in fact, as you are unleavened for Christ, our Passover has also been sacrificed. Let us celebrate the feast, not with leaven or sin in our midst, nor with the leaven of malice or wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. I wrote you in my letter not to associate with immoral people. I did not at all mean with the immoral people of this world or with the covetous and swindlers or with idolaters, for then you would have to go out of the world." Isn't that great? Paul didn't ask you to judge nor stop spending time with the people of this world. You should not be surprised when they do these things. Without Jesus, that's our default. And that is the the light to which God has given us to bring to the darkness. Paul says, no, be with them, be in their midst. Here's the warning. He says, but actually I wrote you not to associate with any so-called brother if he's an immoral person, a covetous or an idolater, a reviler, a drunkard, a swindler, not even to eat with such a one. What's he worried about? The one who carries the name Jesus, but willfully and wantingly, what? Deliberately goes on living opposed to Jesus. Takes the name of Jesus, but gives the testimony of despair, sin, and disdain. You see, I can often, and I say this not to judge others, but to judge myself, carry the name of Jesus, but walk willfully in the sins that surround me. And Paul says, here's the danger. Not the one who doesn't know Jesus, but the one who says they're a a child, a son of Jesus, but carries on in that same way as the earthly. Paul is willing to take that road, and today I want to encourage you that again, as we could go to so many scriptures, that we are called to live a life of discipline. That is standing up and stepping up in our own lives, being bold enough to stand up and step forward in each other's lives. That's a bold thing to do in a loving and friend, friendship way. But I'll tell you what's even bolder, that when a friend comes to be able to receive that word of correction, are we bold enough in our body? It's easy to say this morning that if someone were walking away in which was opposed to the Lord Jesus Christ, we would just set them out of our midst. but are we willing to actually go the hard road? See, Jesus says, treat them as a tax collector. In effect, who did Jesus actually spend all of his time with? Tax collectors, (laughs) prostitutes. In effect, listen, in effect, you're now to treat them as an unbeliever. And in fact, the unbeliever was the one Jesus sought even the more, laid down his life for, paid the price took the long road, the hard road, 
the one that took time. And you see, often, as a church organization, and that's what it becomes, isn't it? An organization. And when we say, you can't come anymore here, you're sinning. People just go down the road to the next social club that will accept them and their lifestyle. There's one church, and I had a friend who pastored all the way over in Ontario, and, and I'll maybe close with a few of these words, and, and it's a challenge for us this morning, and, and, and a few examples to boot. Listen, they were a large church, thousand plus, and they found that their church, unlike here, small community began to lose community. And they made life teams and really put it forward that if you were a part of church, you weren't just part of a Sunday morning that was big and bold, but you were also part of a, a weekly meeting, a mandate to which was meeting in the homes and discussing and talking. And it was in these small groups within this big church that when someone was pregnant, they'd provide meals. And if someone lost a job or lost their car, they'd work together to find a ride for them to get to work. And, and when someone was sick, they would be there to care for them. And when someone was missing in the congregation, they were the ones who noticed someone was missing and made a phone call to say, why weren't you there? Or is everything okay? There was community in the midst of a large congregation. And when church discipline happened, and here's the challenge this morning, everyone. Someone was set outside, not just of a Sunday morning meeting, because to some of us, that's what church becomes, doesn't it? A meeting, a time together, which is meaningful and powerful. And yet, the community of God should be something more than a Sunday morning. And in effect, that when church discipline happened and someone was set aside, they weren't just told they can't come on a Sunday morning. No, they began to take a back seat, sit outside of the care and community that was found in the church of Christ. The care that came with people who loved Jesus and in effect, therefore, loved them as Jesus loved us, sacrificially. And remember, when darkness brings a longing for light and cold brings a longing for warmth, that when their lives were outside of the body of Christ, and when they had chose the things against Christ, and they began to see what it was like to live apart from the body of Christ, guess what began to happen? A hunger to restore fellowship. A hunger to restore the care and concern of the family of Jesus that cannot be found in the rest of this world a hunger for the things in the body of Christ that cannot be found in this earth and this world. Here's my question this morning, everyone. If someone were to be set aside from this congregation, would they feel a difference and a longing that they're actually missing something when they left these doors? Do we live in such a way with the love, care, and concern of Jesus for one another that if someone were to just simply walk down the street and go to another community gathering, that they would actually have a longing for something different, something holy, something eternal, that they're missing, that they do miss from being here with us and in fellowship today with their congregation? Do we live differently from the rest of the world? Challenge, isn't it? We're quick to punish, but slow to think about what true discipline is. And discipline starts with a living rightly, a caring community, loving one another as Christ loved the church, longing that we might be presented as a holy bride, but in that same light, a longing for one another to be presented as shamelessly and spotlessly, willing to say and speak into each other's lives just as we're willing to hear each other when they speak to us. But today it starts there as we begin with one's self, take the log out of one's own eye before taking the speck out of another's. And only there and then can we truly and lovingly begin to start that process, which is discipline. I'll close with these verses in our message. It says this in 1 Timothy. Listen, in pointing out these things to you, brethren, 
You will be good servant of Christ Jesus, constantly nourished on the words of the faith and of the sound doctrine which you have been following, but have nothing to do with the worldly fables fit only for old women. On the other hand, discipline yourself for the purpose of godliness. For bodily discipline is only of little profit, but godliness is profitable for all things since it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. It is a trustworthy statement deserving full acceptance. See, don't walk out these doors simply looking to punish the body, to change one's actions in hope it will achieve righteousness. But go looking and longing for the disciplining of oneself for the purpose of godliness, changing the heart, not only in yourself, but in our children, in our friends, in our families, even willing at times to watch and wait until they come to that place and point where they are longing for the help that comes from him alone, the great and almighty counselor that is Christ. And there and then we all will begin to see him face to face when we acknowledge his presence in this place. I hope that's an encouragement for you, not only congregationally, but personally, in what it means to be disciplined. Changing of the mind, looking to the Lord, taking the long and the hard road, the feeling that weakness is truly the feeling of weakness leaving the body so that strength might come in. Let's pray. Lord, thank you that this morning we can look at these words and be challenged on a very difficult subject. Discipline, hardship, the fact that you are willing to allow us to suffer loss, that there might be gain. Today we thank you that today we might come before you and truly know you and know that you are our God and King, that you as a loving Father are willing to take us, to mold us, to shape us, to walk the hard road, to take the long road in long suffering, and in fact, even at times, to give us what our heart desires, that there and then we might see you face to face. Thank you that you will never leave us nor forsake us. And if there are any here this morning that feel that they are in a time of difficulty, may today we simply humble our hearts, that today as you present for us the opportunity to hear your word, that we too would take that hard road to heart and that we would fight back, indignant with the sin in our lives, sorrowful to the point of repentance, leaving no stone unturned that we might be seen in your holiness. Thank you that today again you are here and you make all this possible, not just by instruction, but by your strength, your wisdom found only in the abiding life of your Son that lives within us. Thank you for all of this. In Jesus' name, amen.